Hello, my name is Matt Storr and I repair saxophones for a living and this is my vintage saxophone overhaul review where I take a look at vintage saxophones from a repairman's perspective. This saxophone is a SML, Revision D. SML stands for Strasser, Marigo, and Le Maire. These saxophones were built from 1935 until 1981. This particular model, uh, while not actually given a model name by the company, uh, is called the Revision D. It's one of the, probably the fourth major design revision they made before the gold medal, which is their most famous saxophone design, so called because it won the gold medal at a uh, instrument manufacturing uh, exposition. SML stands for Strasser Marigo Le Maire, and uh, the company doesn't make saxophones anymore today, but uh, Marigo, you may recognize that name from making professional oboes. Now, SML was based in Paris, France, and was making saxophones along with Selmer, um, Buffet, Cuinon, and a number of other smaller uh, French saxophone manufacturers. And when SML eventually gave up saxophone manufacture, their reason given was that they simply could not compete with Selmer. Uh, and this is borne out by their serial numbers. If you look, uh, their serial numbers between 1935 and 1981 uh, only were about 22,000 saxophones ever made. Um, these are all hand-built. They made between 100 and 400 a year, uh, and they are excellent saxophones if you find them. The prices are going up, and with good reason. They play excellent, they feel excellent under the fingers, um, and when they're in proper working condition, they can play really, really well. This one I just finished a full mechanical overhaul on. Um, and this horn has had a busy life, as you can see from the condition of the lacquer. Uh, and most of the work on this horn was involved in making the key work tight again. Um, sometimes with an old saxophone, if you grab these keys, they'll wiggle back and forth and you can hear click, 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 click. And that's what I had to get rid of on this horn. But everything is nice and tight and nice and free. And that helps it play much better for a couple reasons. Um, here. Now the SML has a couple of interesting uh, things going on with the design. The first thing you might notice is that the tone holes are in line, they are not offset, um, and they've got these long key arms on the right hand to help it feel a little more comfortable so your hands aren't going like this. My favorite thing about SML saxophones, and this is kind of a weird thing, is that um, all the springs on the horn are the same length. If you look at most saxophones and you look at the spring lengths, they're going to be different in each spot depending on where the keys are and what they kind of had to fit in there. On an SML, it seems like they took a really long time thinking about str spring design and almost all the springs on the saxophone are just about the same length. And this is important because let's say you've got a spring this long and a spring this long, right? and they both have to go a certain length, right, in the key action. Now, if you see that they both have to go to here, the angle is greater on the shorter spring. That is, the, the angle of deflection, the ratio that it has to move, is greater relative to the overall length. And if you think about leverage, right, if you're trying to move something with just your wrist versus your entire arm, it's gonna be a lot less movement if you're doing your entire arm. It's the same thing with springs, and since springs uh, have varying degrees of resistance based on how far you push them, having springs all be the same length and having them be relatively long relative to the keys means that your action feels really good and that everything is kind of in line as far as it's supposed to be. Um, and feels very good under the fingers. Nothing feels mushy, nothing feels gummy. And the whole horn feels really digital, that is, you know, when you press down a key, it feels like the same resistance from top to bottom. And on a lot of, a lot of horns, especially up here, this key, all the time, um, when you press it down, it feels pretty light at the top and then really hard at the bottom. And that gives your saxophone a gummy feel under the fingers. Under the fingers. Another interesting uh, design thing about these saxophones is they have adjustment screws, uh, far, way farther back than you commonly see them today. Uh, this particular instrument was built in 1955 um, and it's got adjustment screws on both the upper 
and kind of hard to see, lower stack right here. Um, another interesting design thing you'll see uh, is this pivoting octave thumb rest. It takes a little bit of getting used to. It feels a little bit strange to have your whole thumb move versus just the tip when you're pressing the octave key. But it actually is pretty comfortable, but it does take some getting used to. I'm not sure that this is something you know, I would include on um, a list of the best saxophone design uh, ideas out there, but it does work. One of the things I really love about these horns, let's see if you can see this, is that the neck tenon has four gaps. So when it tightens, they all tighten from the outside, and that's because this ring here is actually completely separate. So instead of there being one gap and it just kind of pinches in an uneven way, it squeezes all the way around and you get a much better grip on the neck and also it doesn't leak. A lot of times saxophones will have a leak in here because if you go ahead and tighten this on your saxophone and you look down you see that it's pinching from one side. This doesn't actually stay completely round and it kind of pinches the top more than the middle or the bottom and so you get an air leak in there uh, which you know the average repairman looks at it doesn't have the tool to, to seal this off and do a suction test. Um, you're going to have a leak at the very top of the horn which is going to affect everything below it and it basically makes your horn feel stuffy, unresponsive um, and you can pull your hair out looking for pad leaks when you've actually got a neck leak. And uh, this particular design, um, barring damage or drop or something like that, just works so much better um, than the design seen on most saxophones today and I wish that manufacturers would, would do this again. Um, you see a little close-up of the engraving there. It's really pretty. Now, this horn has had um, a pretty full life and a lot of the lacquer is gone. Um, it was pretty much covered in corrosion when I got it and it took a lot of cleaning to get it off. Um, but, and this is what was left after all was said and done. The thumb rest is actually pretty comfortable as well. It's curved. It's pretty ergonomic. It feels pretty good. As far as the keys under the fingers, definitely feels different. I would say this feels kind of like a cross between a Con 10M and a uh, Buffet Super Dyne Action. Another interesting thing on these horns, which I actually really like, is there's this little lever here for your G-sharp. When you activate it, now you've got your articulated C-sharp, right? So that the C-sharp and the G-sharp are connected. If you're doing C-sharp arpeggios, that means you don't have to switch between your C-sharp and your G-sharp. And this is a feature that is common on modern, modern saxophones as far as the articulation, but the ability to deactivate it, that is not common. As far as I know, SML is the only manufacturer to do that. And what that does is when you don't need that C-sharp articulation, um, it makes your left-hand pinky table feel much better. Uh, because you don't actually often need that. When you do need it, it's really nice to have, but most of the time you don't need it. And that way you're not pressing against two springs to get your C-sharp down, just one. And that's just a little lever under here that switches back and forth really easy. I mean, you could even do it in the middle of a piece if you had uh, a rest. You know, you're just right here, flip it down, flip it back up. You don't even need to take your fingers off the keys. So that's pretty cool. Uh, also, oh, this is my second favorite thing on the saxophone. The octave mechanism has two springs opposing each other. So, you know how the octave mechanism switches when you do your G. Notice I don't have the neck on, yet the octave mechanism is working as it should. Most designs these days have the neck, have this spring here, provide the force here to lift this octave mechanism up when you press down the G. When the G comes off here, this lifts up because it's being pressed here. Now that's a lot of distance and a lot of linkages for that force to travel, and I always felt like that is a really bad design as far as saxophones go. But this is opposite sprung, so it doesn't need the neck to do that. So it's a self-contained system that works perfectly regardless of whether your material is super slick here or whether this is working as perfectly as it should. Um, and it just gives you a lot more room for error, really, um, which I think is a good thing when you're on the road and you don't want your sax to mess up. Um, it makes your octave switches much cleaner, much faster. And it's such a simple thing to do. I mean, literally, you could do this 
to almost any saxophone out there just by adding a spring cradle and a spring on the top so that it's sprung against itself and it works independently of the neck which I think is, is a wonderful design and something that more, more saxophone manufacturers should do. As far as sound, these horns are dark, I would say, very rich, um, very powerful. This one in particular, um, I could play low B flats all day just because the whole horn vibrates under the fingers while I'm doing it, which is really, really nice. Um, construction is pretty darn good. You've got ribbed construction here on the Revision D. You've got a, a rib that all of your uh, palm pads are on, your stacks are on. Um, pretty solid, durable horn. Uh, the key work is very nicely done, very nicely built, uh, very, relatively easy to work on. It has rolled tone holes, which can be good and bad. Um, if they're damaged or they're unlevel, uh, that can be kind of a pain to fix. But um, luckily, this was in pretty good shape, and you know you've got a little bit of room when you're floating pads to take up some gaps and roll tone holes and I was able to do that and get a really nice seal on this horn. Also got adjustable uh, felt bumpers for your B flat, B, C, E flat. Um, that's fairly standard. And yeah, that's about it. So this is the SML Revision D. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to post. If you've got any video responses, feel free to post. Um, I'm still fairly new at doing these videos, so if you have any comments or suggestions as to how I can make these better, more useful to the saxophone community, please feel free to say something. And uh, always, as always, feel free to get in touch with any saxophone questions you may have. I really love doing this stuff, and uh, I love high-end, vintage, unusual saxophones. That's my specialty. So thanks for watching, thanks for listening, and I uh, hope you found this helpful.